today's guest, Gitte, COO from DISA. The big challenge for executives is always that you feel the pressure from day one on to deliver. And I think this is where you need to be confident enough to take your time and to communicate very clearly when are you delivering. And I'm, I'm, I'm always doing this and setting the stage very clearly and uh, say, okay, after maybe 60 days, so two months, I'm ready to speak for the first time about the good, the bad and the ugly. Mm -hmm. On a very high level, where mm -hmm. I see the immediate challenges, uh, etc. Sometimes I also need to take immediate, um, immediate um, decisions. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, but kind of like when you outline your broader strategy, and it's not just tactical. Take enough time, and I think I encourage all CEOs and the peers and the executive team to appreciate that it takes up to two months, and then you need to show consistency. And you need to update your peers about the changes you make. You also need to listen to the changes they are making. And this is why we, for example, we have a weekly C-level meeting. Gitte is a legal counsel turned COO. So with her legal background, turning into a broader management role, this is, I think, a very interesting episode because it is a very um, unique background, in my opinion. And... Um, We also talked about the music industry or the creator industry overall because she just returned from um, a course or a week in the Harvard University where they did a case study on Mr. Beast, the biggest, most successful YouTuber. And we also talked about boards, C-level, executive communication, how to build trust, what are the different styles on how teams interact with and also what's the ramp up time of an executive team and what can you expect. So I think very insightful, listen to it and get your own opinion um, and let me know what you think. Then you can build trust and then you can spend less time communicating and more time just getting shit done. Then I went home and, and thought about this sentence. We basically put it on the table. Hiring takes time. People are trained. How to objectively judge certain situations. It's very, 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 very hard to change things. That was the learning. Entrepreneurs with empathy. On the people side. Good morning, Gitte. Good morning, Thomas. Um, I'm happy that you are here because we met at an event, I think it was a couple of weeks or even a month ago in Berlin, where you were a speaker and you talked about executives and boardrooms and everything around that, right? Indeed, yeah, that was with the Secret HR Society and it must be about a month, so. Yes, and you came now freshly from... Um, from Paris. Harvard, from Paris, and also from, from, Paris, the, from yeah. Harvard, you from also Harvard, have been, yeah. right? Yeah, I spent a week at Harvard Business School last week, so not Harvard University, Harvard Business School, um, joining a class about the business of entertainment, media, and sports, which was uh, very exciting, very insightful. Came back with a lot of inspirational ideas. And what what did you do there? Because your role at Deezer sent you there, or just because of personal interest? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Uh, my current CEO at Tisa um, attended the first, when, when this course was established, he attended the first class and he was very excited. And when I joined Tisa as a COO, um, he said, Gitte, you need to do this, apply, apply. And I said, okay, well, let me apply and see what happens. And I was accepted and uh, now it took place. And in the beginning, I have to admit, I was a little bit like, wow, I'm here as a COO. I'm all about numbers. I'm all all about performance, about operational systems. Um, but throughout these four days uh, class and lecture and uh, with all the people I had a chance to meet, I think I got a much better understanding of what really drives uh, the business of entertainment, media and sport and how much passion, dedication and commitment is there from everyone um, in the business. And When you want to be successful, might it be as a creator or as a performer or as an executive in this area, you need to put yourself out there every single day. And I think this was an interesting insight for me coming from an entirely different background. And you also talked briefly before about Mr. Beast. So you also met the manager of Mr. Beast? Yeah, I had, a, had the pleasure to meet Mark, uh, the CEO of Mr. Beast. And I think he... Uh, we also did a case study on Mr. Beast and uh, 
uh, together with this case study and uh, what Mark explained to us, how he runs the business behind it. It's, it's a very exciting world. And I truly believe that um, the content creators on YouTube, on TikTok, um, are some force to watch out for, not only in the business world, but definitely in the media world. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I'm fascinated. And what is really the interesting piece about Mr. Beast is he strongly believed in what he was doing. I mean, he's like an athlete on YouTube. Obsessed. This is, yeah, not only an obsession. It's what he wants to do. He wants to become the superstar. And by the way, he is now. I mean, yes. he has, he's utterly succeeded in, in being the best in his, um, um, his, his field of expertise. And he developed that and he's never made compromises on the quality of what he produces. He took big bets, but he was fairly confident. And now, I don't know, what is his followership now? 180 million, 150 million. I mean, even if it's, I, it's a crazy number. So, and with what he created, the world is wide open for him. And what I really like about him, he has a strong business sense. Obviously, with someone like Mark, who's working working with content creators for 17 years, um, um, he's someone at his side that is a consultant and knows business inside out, but he has a strong business sense. So he created, for example, Feastable, the chocolate bar company. Mr. Um, Beast Burgers. Mr. Beast Burgers. Um, and these are strongly performing performing companies but he also invested into his second passion which is which is philanthropy so um, he also gives back and the world is wide open for him uh, and yeah, this also created the whole reach right it was also a concept of his videos that he is just giving away free money and yeah um, well i mean whether you can consider that philanthropy or not, <laughs> yeah, maybe not, maybe not. Just, i mean he knows how to play the game yeah yes. it's not and i think this is what we urgently need to overcome is kind of like seeing content creators as this oh i'm just putting an iphone in my face and i'm having you accompanying myself through the day these are these are enterprises and machines and they are specialists in production and creation and in reach and analytics I think we are utterly mistaken if we underestimate uh, those that are successful content creators on what, whatever platform it might be. And people follow people. I think that's really true in that space, right? So if you have this personality and you have a followership, you have power. So you Absolutely. can do with it whatever you kind of want and also what fits to you. Absolutely. And I think what is key there, and uh, by the way, that applies to every successful executive as well, is you have to be authentic. And you have to be consistent. You can't make compromises. You need to have a very clear vision, a very clear ambition that speaks to you personally. No coach, no brand agency can give that to you. If it's not authentic, it's not going to fly. But you also need to consistently pursue this. And I think then then you will be successful no matter what your, your mission is in this yes. world. <laughs> Before we talk a bit about um, the whole... C-suite executives and yeah. so on. Um, can you give us a bit more context about yourself? Yes, of course, with pleasure. So I'm, uh, my name is Gitte, you already know this. I'm a German-born and uh, trained attorney. So I spent my childhood in Germany. I went to university in Germany, but then left Germany pretty soon after that. Traveled the world, worked as a general counsel, as a legal specialist in different corporations worldwide, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, the US, Mexico, but I always had a tendency to look outside of my legal realm into the business world. So I always worked very closely with the business teams. And eventually, uh, when I joined Spark Networks here in Berlin, um, I transitioned from a general counsel role into a chief operating officer role for the first time in my career, gradually built my portfolio. And I'm now since, uh, I think, 14 months, so a good year, first anniversary, just celebrated. I'm with Deezer, a Paris-based music streaming company, and I'm, uh, I'm a CEO there, and I'm overseeing a broad portfolio of departments ranging from ad sales, brand partnerships, through content, um, through revenue, um, customer care. Um, and yeah, this is what I'm busy with. So former German attorney became, I think, maybe a global COO without bragging too, 
too much about it myself but <laughs> yeah, it's quite cool I yes think i think so too <laughs> i think so too i very much enjoy it i mean i've never planned for this career i've always assumed well i studied law in germany so maybe a law firm well let's see but uh, maybe an in-house counsel and then all of a sudden opportunities came up and i think i've always been a bit fearless some might call it naive i just grabbed the opportunity when it sound interesting and this is where i am i never shied away and what's the size of Deezer now it's around 700 800 people i had 600 people a little more of 600 people most of them in the headquarter in paris so it's a french company uh, with offices also here in berlin and mm -hmm. sao paulo and uh, london and how what's the scope of your responsibility compared to the other executives Well, it's really, truly about operations. I mean, there are so many different COOs in this world. Um, some are specialists in their area when they oversee, for example, product, technology, marketing. Um, I'm more of a generalist. And what I'm really looking uh, is to give the company an operating system. It is really looking into how do the different departments coordinate. And I'm usually having departments in my portfolio that uh, need a refresh or a transformation because the company strategy might Exciting. have changed, the goals are going bigger. It indeed is, but it makes me a true generalist. And I always say my teams, I, I have teams full of meta expert that can outperform me easily. And I think this is also what, what I learned throughout my journey. It's you don't need to be the meta expert in everything you, you, you do. You need to find the best people in their profession that uh, become loyalty members, are there to support you, never shy away from asking the odd question, um, and trust in your team. And what role do boards and also the other C-level members have mm -hmm. for your role as a dependency? It's critical. I mean, I'm speaking about my teams uh, when I think about uh, the different departments I ultimately oversee, but my team is really the team of peers I have. And I'm fortunate to work with great executives um, uh, that are uh, running DISA. Um, a CEO I know very well. I worked with him before at Spark Networks. Mm. So there's a connection. Always makes it easier, obviously. Um, they are critical for my success. Um, if I'm thinking about an operating system, I'm ultimately doing this to facilitate their work on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to be very close to them, listen to them, understand them, constantly communicate, and we need to trust each other. Um, that I'm having their best interest in mind and that they are kind of like trusting me to ultimately find the operating model that makes them succeed. So they are my team. They are my peers. The board? You asked for the board. The big question, the board. What about the board? Deezer is a publicly listed company. Um, so the board is instrumental. Obviously, they are representing the shareholder interests, although not all board members, and I think this is a point I like to make, are ultimately connected to shareholders. Um, there are requirements that most or the majority of the board members for a publicly listed company have to be independent. But still, they oversee the investor interests. And sometimes this can be challenging because as an executive team, you have to run the operations on a daily basis. And you have a vision that is mid-term and long-term. But when the share price takes a hit, then your board is obviously uh, putting pressure on you and uh, to finding a good balance to communicate clearly to the board to outline your strategy and get their trust is as, as instrumental as, as having the trust of your peers. In case you like my show, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Trust. How do you get the trust at that level? Because I think that's a critical first yeah. step you always need to get right, right? Otherwise, you don't have the power to operate if they totally, don't trust you. Totally. I mean, that's that's critical. And this is such a difficult topic, I mean, to describe. Um, I believe it's it's a mixture of a lot of things. It's really your personality as well, yeah, your integrity, how you come across. Mm -hmm. And that might sound a little bit like, oh, but yeah, but I should convince by my good work. That's the second piece. You need to know what you're doing. Yeah? There is, if you if you're not solid in your skills... You don't get the trust, but there's also something about what you bring to the table as a person. And um, this is the second piece. And then 
constant communication. And what I always find critical, I can't communicate with the ward or my peers the way I like to communicate. I need to understand what their needs are mm. in terms of information, in terms of details, in terms of context. And I always need to put myself into the shoes of, of others to get the message across. I think this is critical not to reflect on your communication from your own perspective, but always taking the perspective of those who need to be convinced. How did you learn that? Because a, a lot of people communicate exactly in that way. They just very fast maybe forward something and yeah. they know what it's about, but the receiver then needs to really dig into the thread of an email or maybe ask three more follow-up questions to yeah. really get the context. How did you learn that? And what's the principles you use? I think it's it's why I learned it, because I've always been curious for context. I've always asked, so why are we doing this? Why is it this way? Not necessarily to challenge everything, but I'm a strong believer you can only drive the future when you understand the past. And it's also a question of respect for what has happened before you joined a company, before you joined an executive team or maybe a board. Yeah, respecting the, the other's time as well, yeah. right? And, and it's not only time, it's about respecting how the company has been run. I mean, I can't come in there like a trunk and change everything, even if this might be my instinct guts. And usually I'm brought in in situations that require change. But there are always reasons why things are the way they are. And being a very contextual person always led me, and a curious person, and maybe also a person, person that relies very strongly on logic. I can't stand things that don't make sense. So I always try to find a sense in everything that happens. It's not always the case. A lot of things don't make sense, even when you look close at it. But um, I think kind of like this drive I always had to understand where it comes from allowed me over the years, and I mean, I'm now having a career for 20 years, allowed me to really develop an understanding what the needs of others are, how they, they see things, uh, what their perspective is. And I need to develop this every time again when I join a new company and a new industry. And this is, we were talking about the Howard Business School. This is why such lectures are so important. Um, you can't even when you, when you think, oh, wow, now I'm at the pinnacle of my career. I, I've seen it. I'm obviously successful. I get the feedback. I, I'm working positively with the companies I'm, I'm at. Um, you could never stop learning and never stop questioning um, and also kind of like staying humble about what you know what you don't know and we spoke about the team and meta experts so I guess it's really how I learned it is by listening maybe it comes down to asking and then listening because a lot of people are asking but they already expect an answer mm -hmm. and I simply don't know many things so I'm reliant on the answers. Honest, ask honest questions and listen. Don't expect a certain answer that confirms. And how can I imagine the communication then with the other C-level members or the board? Do you WhatsApp with them or are you on a communication tool like Slack or do you email or do you just... Everything. It's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody's getting lost. <laughs> no, it's actually... I think it's it's different. Not all of us have... And, and I think this is also a question of respect. Not all of us prefer the same way of communicating. Mm. So I'm probably the one that uh, prefers Slack, that prefers WhatsApp. And I'm honestly, even in the 21st century and after coming out of a pandemic, I still prefer the personal interaction and I'm enjoying the occasional phone call without Zoom, by the way. Yeah. So um, um, I think I prefer kind of like direct communication but this is also related to my working style when i'm having a problem an issue i can be quite impatient to solve it so it's like what whatsapp usually it? gives me direct <laughs> access and like <laughs> yes. then and then know. usually my peers i think my peers <laughs> know when i'm sending an email that's probably not as urgent as as me sending a Slack. And I think this is where we found a good groove on, on You need Slack. to get to know each other there, right? Absolutely. You need to test it. And we also have uh, people in our C-level that are not using Slack. So mm. I know I get a hold of them differently, but probably by passing by their door. And that's totally fine mm. for me. You need to figure that out and uh, then you get into the groove. But yes, we WhatsApp a lot. And what we use WhatsApp for, and this is what I enjoy so much, is actually sharing we we are in the music streaming industry we are in the entertainment industry we are not only about bringing music to life 
through streaming, but we are creating experiences. These might be pre-release parties, these might be sessions. Um, just this week in Paris, we had a great great rooftop session, uh, can be seen on YouTube. I'm hope, I hope I can make this little advertisement. Yeah, sure. Check we it can out also, on YouTube. These are rooftop it sessions. Watch it, check it out. It's brilliant. And we had uh, one of the finest Afrobeat stars uh, with us, Mr. Easy, this week. Great party atmosphere. The next day we um, had a pre-release uh, party of uh, Christine and the Queens. I'm not sure whether everyone recalls him, um, which was an entirely different event. So that's, uh, that's cool. I need to check that out because funny enough, um, sometimes here in this apartment we make some parties with music and DJs, and then a neighbor found out because of the loud music and now asked me to. Did you get into trouble with your parties here? Not yet. <laughs> Never the, the police never came, <laughs> but the neighbors woke up sometimes, and then they also then joined the next party. So good parties. <laughs> oh, so you're doing good parties. I've never been invited. You need to do this. Yeah, <laughs> maybe next time. And then um, now a couple is marrying, and now I I do a DJ set for them at their wedding with Afrobeats. So I will check that out. <laughs> Absolutely, it's. I mean, we can we can talk ample about it because I'm personally a fan of Afrobeat. I like it very much. Um, Very much to my surprise, to be honest, uh, but I love it. And there are so many great musicians. And I think it's also one topic that gets me very passionate about when I think about content and the influence of, of streaming services, how you kind of like globalize music. Although I've read there's a, another phenomenon that is called globalization, which by the global availability of music leads countries to focus more on local music. Mm -hmm. We can probably do a podcast about that alone and how this plays into video streaming. But I think you, you've really, you've really uh, asked me about WhatsApp. And the point I wanted to make, we, we have a lot of events always uh, happening. And it's not only the music events, but there are partners we are working with, like Sonos in the US, like RTL. So we use WhatsApp mostly about sharing successes but also observations. So our WhatsApp channel is more like an executive Instagram, I think, than a WhatsApp channel. And yes, we occasionally share the odd, odd pictures too. So yeah, but I, I think, yes, I would describe it as an executive Instagram. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, we are a pretty cool bunch. No, I have great peers. I've always had in, in all my career steps. And when you... so. When we maybe zoom a bit out and mm -hmm. try to model the way communication works in a executive level team, um, what, what are the mandatory f occasions you use maybe in terms of meetings? Do you have certain routines that are official, which also have, let's say, board representation and has to be there because you're a public company and you need to follow certain structures? Of course. And what do you do? Additionally to that and why that would be super interesting because I think every company works differently and every team works differently. But what's your dynamic and why are you doing certain ways you, how you do it? I think this is very specific to every company. Yes. And I think um, putting a little bit my COO uh, uh, hat on, it depends really on the stage the company is in. Mm -hmm. You have an entirely different communication style in a company in crisis and transition than when you have in a company in hyper growth mode or whether you have in a company that just runs well these should exist i've learned i haven't seen one but uh, that's because uh, because i'm always brought in in transitions um, it is utterly different um, what is very important is making enough space for the topics in the executive team It is not just because we are executives and we usually have a very deep understanding of the how, how the company works uh, that we don't need time to map out problems. And I think this is what most executive teams are underestimating. It takes time to solve the difficult issues. And you also need to feel comfortable to occasionally uh, create a bit of discomfort. Yeah. Um, this is also... Um, I think it's critical. It's not happening because you want to be the sports boy or the bad guy or the naysayer, but it's part of your job. I mean, is this is, dynamic then um, being created? At, yes, absolutely, over some time? absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm known for I'm known for being very straightforward. This was something we discussed when we met for the first time. It's actually some feedback I always get. Most contributed to my 
German upbringing. <laughs> the, <laughs> so, German is here. the German is here. Oh, well, now we are talking. Um, no, but it's it's also my personality. As I said, I I can't stand things that don't make sense. Mm. And when I, with all these experience I have, and having seen so many organizations and having worked with so many different people and having gone through my career from being super junior in the legal department, now being a COO with a, uh, with a substantial responsibility. I, I think I've, I've seen where I said, which if someone would ask me, what are the mistakes you've made? Or when do you think you didn't perform at your best? It was usually the times when I didn't raise concerns. And there's always a way to do it, context, um, respect for communication. I mean, you can't just sit there and swear and say, this doesn't make sense. Explain it and point at the pain point immediately. And you need to trust your peers. And I think you wouldn't be in, in this executive team if you wouldn't be surrounded by peers that are equally smart, um, that think differently, but that understand the problem. Mm -hmm. So I think my my when I look back and say ugh what what went wrong and why did it go wrong it's usually that I didn't raise concerns out of respect maybe That's also a bit the responsibility of each individual then, Absolutely. right because otherwise you never Absolutely. have the full picture and, and you don't understand the problem and you cannot solve it You're so right but it's also kind of like it's a tough call to make mm -hmm. because you're usually always interfering with the responsibility of, of one or multiple of your peers And how do you yeah. make sure that there is no blaming happening Uh, well, because it's not about that. Yes, I mean, it's all about the company. It's, yeah. But isn't I mean, there a risk sometimes that people are maybe also afraid of that or that even blaming yeah, that's happens? Not, that's not very constructive. And it's maybe not. this is where I'm having a bit of a blind spot that there could be blaming. Um, but it's when you raise these problems, it's not to bring a problem to the table, but you feel, or this is at least how I approach it, you feel that the, the problem you bring forward mm is or, or a discussion about the problem is relevant to find a solution. Sometimes you also bring only the solution. But when you know, for example, you, 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 we talked a bit about buy-in and trust. Um, I think this is also the fine art to understand when do I bring a problem for or, or when do I need others to contribute to the solution? Although I might have something in my mind, but when do I feel I rather get, get I need the buy-in from others? Um, but I'm also open to listen to maybe there's a different solution that is even better than what I thought. Um, and this is when you bring forward the problem and you point at it when you, when you need everyone to come from the same, uh, same perspective. And in terms of politics, it, it's always, Ooh, a, yes. <laughs> a, it's always a bad term. Yeah. But it can also be positive in a certain way that you just brief certain people in a way because you need to, to have a certain outcome and yes. they need to have certain... Um, preparations, right? So, uh, how, wh what is the dynamics with with politics, with C level members or boards? I mean, you constantly need to influence others. Mm. I mean, that's that's just critical in my job. I mean, I can't just sit in isolation. Isolation. Um, I think that's the same for all all my peers, but mostly for those who have multiple departments to oversee. Um, and I wouldn't say this is politics. It's just diplomacy. So, and some say that's politics, right? Um, it's influencing. It's influencing. And I mean, this is kind of like when you start in your career, when you do your first assessment for your first job, they always assess how do you influence others. And I mean, this is probably where in-house counsels are very well trained because we usually don't have a reporting line into the business. We are not part of the business. It's the same maybe a little bit for finance, but you need to constantly convince others of your decisions. And this is when you learn the subtle art of, of diplomacy. And I think when it becomes, or the connotation of the word politics is when you do it for your own advantage. Mm. This is never a good idea when you do it for your own career uh, uh, progression, when you do it to maybe get the credit from the board. When you are an executive, do you have to buy an into the thought that it's not about you. It is always about the company and the team and the executive team. And I think this is the difference between diplomacy and politics for me. And what role does the whole incentivation of the executive team 
take um, um, is should be taken into consideration when also making sure that politics is maybe not happening because I think the incentive of each individual should also contribute to not doing politics but doing Absolutely. the right thing. Absolutely. It's acknowledging which role every individual or every department plays. And funnily enough, I was just doing a deep dive into DISA uh, to see what is ultimately the best operating model. Uh, I mean, a year in, it takes time to do this. So I can't do this in the first six weeks. I mean, this would be great if mm. I could, but then I would probably be out of a job uh, uh, every six months. So that's not the purpose. No, but uh, now after a year, I really took took some time to uh, get into a little bit of a zone and analyze what is working well, what is not working well, so what's my next focus point. And when I look into the different kind of like, you can use so many different operating models, but they all come down to a couple of things. And one of it is service delivery internally. And I think this is what a lot of companies oversee, that you need to be very clear in an organization about What is the contribution? What is really the product or the service a function delivers internally? And especially when you're in a user-facing B2C business, you quite often forget that it's not only the user or in our case also the partner. We have a very strong arm uh, with uh, in our B2B business. It's not only the partner and the user you cater for. You also have services you deliver internally. Mm -hmm. And this is also where I have to say we also at Deza, we are a bit blurry and I think... We are not the only company, so it's not a bad thing. You can work on that. But this is also, I think, critical to answer your question. Um, you need to understand and you need to be confident about your own delivery in the executive team, maybe also on a personal level, but certainly on a professional level, but also what your teams contribute. And this also needs to be clear to your peers. And sometimes it's not. And that is, doesn't mean they don't understand the business. It's just... They don't are not clear about what your teams are doing. And as funny as it sounds, it's not a lack of respect. It's just kind of like a need for explanation. And this is also why, for example, um, at DISA, uh, we kind of like we, we go through the departments and we're not shying away from really explaining what we are doing, the vision, the mission. That is very important for me to, to always be very clear about what does a team need to do, mm -hmm. to be very clear about the contribution. And then you have a well-oiled machine. I mean, I know this is very high level, but uh, the personal incentive for executives, I think, comes out of delivering against their team's mission and vision. So always be, this is, I think something you need to set up in the first 100 days. In case you have any feedback or anything you want to share with me, please send me an email on thomas at peoplewise.com or hit me up on LinkedIn. And in case you really enjoy the show, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. very specific. That's good. And this would be my next question. So what do you think? How much time does it take to, to build an executive team or maybe to to set up individual executives for success that they can start creating value or not creating value, but that you see output of their work. Hmm. That's a very good team, uh, a very good topic, not a team, a very good topic. Um, And a great question, actually, um, because it takes time. It never stops. Yeah, yeah. You will never be There's there. Always a change, I mean, right? the, the company <laughs> changes. So also what you have to cater for changes. I mean, let's take the, the past year. We came from, and we spoke about it before we, we started uh, recording, about hyper growth, blitz scaling. It was all about this, this massive, you, you showed me this massive growth, yeah, massive, creating massively valuable companies. Um, Now it's more kind of like creating profitable companies that are still set up for growth, but doing it in a more sustainable way, um, in a more, um, uh, yeah, with a more long-term term, term vision. So this is changing. Yeah. So the executive team has to change. I think the big challenge for executives is always that you feel the pressure from day one on to deliver. And I think this is where you need to be confident enough to take your time and to communicate very clearly when are you delivering. And I'm, I'm, I'm always doing this and setting the stage very clearly and uh, say, okay, after maybe 60 days, so two months, I'm ready to speak for the first time about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. 
on a very high level where I see the immediate challenges, um, etc. Sometimes I also need to take immediate, um, immediate um, decisions. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. But kind of like when you outline your broader strategy and it's not just tactical, take enough time. And I think I encourage all CEOs and the peers in the executive team to appreciate that it takes up to two months. And then you need to show consistency and you need to update your peers about the changes you make. You also need to listen to the changes they are making. And this is why we, for example, we have a weekly C-level meeting, not only a monthly one or a business, a quarterly business review. We have blocked every week four hours. We do not always need them, but four hours every week, all uh, um, executives in their agenda to make enough space to discuss this and follow up. So I think for you... The follow-up piece is important, I think. Yeah. This gets yeah. lost so many times, right? Yes. I mean, it's... Companies start yeah. new initiatives here and there and there, but that was started and maybe yeah. 40, 60... It's a journey company. you're on. And yeah. I think this is what I spoke about when I mean consistency. Always reflect on the journey you're on and this, this, the direction can change and you might take, might see things differently. Um, I had this experience as well because... I had worked um, with most of the departments I'm currently overseeing before, but not with the content team. So I've never led a content team before, yeah, an editorial team, artist relation, production. It's not something I've, I've uh, learned before. And I think only after a year, I'm ready to really... Um, have the impact I should have as a COO. And am I happy with that? I wish you, I would have been faster, but I need to be honest, I needed to learn. And yeah. fortunately, I got the space. But I also got the trust from uh, from my CEO in this case and, and my peers that they saw with my general skill set, I can address the challenges the company might have in this area. And they gave me enough space and enough time to really onboard enough meta expertise to now go go deeper into the organization don't expect you you know everything no. even if you've seen everything this is just i think this is the the most challenging piece and be open with your peers what your priorities are and why and where you might need more time also rely on them use them as partners for brainstorming use them as partners for giving you guidance, listening to them. Don't come in into a new uh, senior uh, or into a new executive team and just think, okay, I'm now here as a COO or CMO or even the CEO, and I need to know it all. This is when you will utterly fail, and this is not yeah, And the good trust. thing is at, at that level you can yeah. hire experts, like strong directors who know exactly Correct, the correct. And this is what I mean. All my all my team members are, have far more expertise in the areas no, uh, it should, they this is how I, it should be right i'm good in finding the right people that's, i mean that's I'm a having skill a set. <laughs> that's a skill set and i think this is also what sets and also making them work together and making sure absolutely that this is a team but that i mean that's what my core business is so to yes, say but it's right? not that straight so it's not always that trivial no right? no no it's not always that trivial but this is kind of like if i wouldn't have that skill set i wouldn't be a good ceo That's true. right <laughs> i mean this is this is just what what i'm brought in for and i think this is also a little bit a pledge to all executives teams don't just use the coo to centralize certain departments and reduce the number of reporting lines to the ceo hold the coo and use the coo um um as kind of like giving you guidance on how the whole company generally operates. Mm -hmm. This is the skill set we have, and we've developed it over the years, coming from entirely different directions, from entirely different backgrounds. But this is our little superpower, so use it. Yeah, Like um, use the superpower of a CMO also, not only for external communication, use it for internal communication, use it to build your own brand as yes. an executive. It is so relevant to think about that as well. So don't see this always in isolation, see it comprehensively and look at the executive team. And I think this is also the individual contribution. Where are the different persons really good at? And we, for example, uh, we have uh, an interesting setup for us. The uh, the C CFO and uh, deputy CEO is also overseeing our B2B business. So he is also a chief commercial officer mm. to a certain extent. And he's brilliant at selling. It's just kind of like he's so close to the partners. When you see him on stage or 
in a discussion, speaking to partners, how he presents the company. So I'm taking him any time when I have to sell something because that might not be my strong suit. Um, so use also the individual superpowers in an executive team. And I think this is also when you think about how you hire your executive team, how you build it. It's not only kind of like about the, uh, the role the, and so on. The, the role. Job description. It's, it's also the personality, about right? what comes out of the yes. role that you need at this moment. And what's the person? Yeah. What's and the background as well? Or not the absolutely. background, what's the spikes? Absolutely. And I mean, this is more and more becoming more and more relevant. I, I'm working internationally now probably for 15 years. Didn't do the math, but for 15 years. And I enjoy working internationally because it's a challenge but also kind of like so enriching working with different cultures and different education, backgrounds in terms of education, in terms of career, um, in terms of exposure. So I would, I think I would still have a hard time to join a company that is German only or French only. And it's nothing to do with these cultures as such, but it's just that I find those executive teams that are having very diverse backgrounds and upbringings are the most uh, innovative. And I strongly believe this is one of the main tasks, not only to create stability, but while creating stability, drive innovation that's and great. futuristic yes, thinking. That's great. Another final question. What is a guest I should interview next that you know I don't know yet? Um, I think you should give it a try with Christian Vollmann, um, who is an investor, very known in the Berlin scene, and I'm very impressed. Uh, not only I met him a couple of times, and he's very approachable, great personality, but I think it's very interesting to look into his investment decisions um, uh, from, from his perspective and view on uh, the impact investors, successful investors, can may can have and should have um, on all the challenges. You worked with him. I've I've worked at the company. He he was an investor, and so I met him a couple of times. And I'm always um, following him on on LinkedIn, and I'm always impressed. But there are so many people you could interview, which I find inspiring and great. Yeah, let's That's try it with close Christian. to home. <laughs> yeah, well, I can give you a list. <laughs> yeah, d definitely, I will use that. I can I can give you a list, and I also think. And this is also what I learned at Deza is never sh shy away from, from giving it a try. Yes. You will find that even the biggest investors, the biggest stars in their area, when you come with a good suggestion and a clear purpose, why you want to work with them, it's not for their star appeal or their followership, but you care about what they are doing. Um, you will always usually find an It's super interesting opinion. because Christian was a real, um, Urgestein in the startup world Crazy, and right? now jumps into a bit of a different field, right? Totally. And this is the, this is, and I would love listening to him. I haven't seen him for a while. Probably the last time we bumped into each other was during the pandemic and uh, we hardly recognized each other because we had all these masks. But um, I think it's very, I would love to, to hear his view on how the role of investors has changed mm -hmm. um, over the past years. Um, and he's taking a very strong uh, uh, stake now, obviously, in, in uh, technology, climate change. I'm not sure this is his passion. I mean, he's an investor. So there's certainly a lot of business reason behind it. And I would love to hear what drives him now compared to earlier endeavors or what's the consistency uh, that he sees in, in his decisions. So, I try to make it happen. <laughs> I'm not only a fan, I want to make this clear. I know a lot of great founders and investors, so it's not only Christian Vollmann, but that one comes to mind and uh, it's a fascinating person, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay.